Uh, my name's Scott Clark. I'm Coast Salish from the Klalam uh, people. Uh, we're at the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples Housing Forum on how we can work better uh, amongst ourselves and with Canada and others to address the housing crisis faced by the 85% of Indigenous peoples living off the reserves. Aichka. And I would like to call upon again uh, President uh, Scott Clark from the Northwest Indigenous Council for a special presentation. President uh, Scott Clark from Northwest Indigenous Council. Good morning, folks. Um, back up here again. Um, Scott Clark, Coast Salish, Cloud. I am a status Indian from an Indian I can council called Teacher Bay on Southern Vancouver Island. And then uh, uh, I guess I'm a product of Bell C31. And my children have now just got their status, my three sons, uh, through the Deshnaw. Very well aware of the history of the Indian Act on our peoples and the challenges that our people face housing uh, in particularly my own personal experiences in the urban context with a single mother and six children. Um, having lived on six different reservations. And uh, so I have, have a little bit of background on housing. As the former president of the United Nations Society, who was also the president of BC Native Housing Society, as well as the vice president. And a little bit more on that, was I was also on the executive of the National Aboriginal Housing Association at the late 90s, the early 2000s. And that was a very difficult time for our people because the federal government uh, through CNHC was devolving housing to the provinces. And at that time, we were advocating that housing is a federal fiduciary responsibility for all Indigenous peoples on reserve officer status and on status, Métis and Inuit. We actually even worked collaboratively with housing organizations to take CMHC to court in the late 90s. But the politics of the day, the housing provider actually had to withdraw the court action in fear of losing their agreements with Canada at the time. So I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview on this. I'm not going to try and mess this thing up, uh, so click thing on housing and um, sort of lay some of the patchwork, the groundwork for, for what it is that we're here for. And um, the issues we face today, uh, they are very similar to the issues we've faced in the past. And really our challenge is how do we put our, our brains together, our hearts together, to give CAP a really solid document that can build some unity. Uh, not just within CAP, which has a very rich, diverse perspective, but also with the housing providers, the friendship centers, the core workers, because it is time that we need to work together. It is time. We need to do this for our children, our youth, our families, our elders. So on that, I will start this presentation. Folks, it's nothing new for us as Indigenous folks. <coughs> The challenge of uh, colonialism when Canada was created in 1867, British Columbia came into Canada in 1871. We never had homelessness within our people's territories. We were welcome when we went from one nation's territory to another nation's territories. We were peeking in, we were given space to, to be ourselves, to do whatever business we had to do when we were in other people's territories. That isn't the case today. With the Canada and British Columbia, when they're trying to figure out how to work with us on the West Coast, because BC came in in 1871, they were debating amongst themselves. How do we work with these different Indian people who they thought were going to die off? And they deliberately decided that they were going to use villages, which later became band councils when the Indian Act came into effect. 1876. So that was by design. To tear apart our tribal nations, to work with us as villages, to divide us, and to make us much more conquerable. 
and the remnants of the legacy of the Indian Act is with us today. Today, we have 634 band councils in Canada, 203 of them in British Columbia. I come from 63 tribal nations. So these are some of the challenges we live with today. Because how do we unite? The fundamental rights we have can be covered under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Back then, when I was with the National Aboriginal Housing Association, we were very clear. Housing is a treaty right, it is a human right, and it's a right that's covered under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We can't stress that enough. It's a federal fiduciary responsibility that the Supreme Court of Canada, Daniel's decision, reaffirmed that the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples uh, began that court case. I believe it took 17 years for that case to uh, finally be recognized. Not was about six years ago, the federal government's responsibility for non-status and Métis peoples to housing. Under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and the necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control, Article 25. We talk about wraparound services. What does it look like in the modern context, given the colonial tsunami that we face as officer of indigenous people from the federal government, the provincial governments, and the municipal governments? And then the wide array of non-profit service providers, and then the band councils. Some people say it's a very complicated world. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think we make it complicated because we're dealing in a lens that is built and maintained off the backs of the first peoples of these territories. The resources are deliberately withheld from us to make our own decisions, to determine our own futures, and to have safe, suitable, affordable homes for our children and their families and our elders. UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples have the right without discrimination to the improvement of their economic and social conditions, including inter alia in the areas of education, employment, vocational training, and retraining, housing, sanitation, health, and social security. Article 21. Whew, sounds a little bit familiar to the previous one. We've heard you folks. We know we need that continuum of care. We know we need that continuum of house. But we have to stick down our way through all these barriers that are put before us. A fundamental issue amongst indigenous peoples, regardless of, of where we come from, is we are collective. We cooperate. We support our children and our families in our homes, in our villages. These are the principles that have been whittled away from us over the decades. And here we are in 2023, UNDRIP, which took well over 30 years to be developed, is the baseline. Canada adopted uh, CANDRIP a couple years ago, BC, everyone's looking at BC, because BC is the great uh, uh, opportunity for UNDRIP, because it's the first Western government to adopt it two or three years ago. And then the city of Vancouver adopted it in two years ago. In each of their cases, none of them consulted indigenous peoples. None of them. They did this through the pandemic when we couldn't meet. We couldn't. The most important legislation Canada had was passed without talking to indigenous peoples. And we know. Uh, CMHC, one bureaucracy, was within many other bureaucracies, 
that they do have a national housing strategy. I think they passed around 2019 or thereabouts. And obviously housing has been a very contentious issue for our folks forever. That those of you that saw the housing conditions in the downtown east side and how the federal, provincial, and civic governments work together to create communities of, and the, the current housing model. I don't think anybody with good sense would think good people that want to care for children and families think putting housing, so many people with so many challenges in one building in the worst community. That's not good sense. It's not. But it is by design. Make no mistake. We have an opportunity here. There's apparently approximately 300 million. I keep hearing all these different numbers. 280 million, 380 million, 300 million, about to see 300 million. That Canada is trying to get out the door and trying to get that money out there so that some of the officer uh, housing providers can boost up their capacity and support some of the growing needs around housing. And so this is why we're here today. How is CAP collectively with its distinct regions and distinct needs going to somehow encapsulate all of our brains into these documents so CAP can come forward with a position that honors our principles of unity, of cooperation, of accountability, and transparency. That's all you have to do. That's the work. And I can assure you that $300 million, like it sounds like a lot of money, it's a drop in the bucket. It's a drop in the bucket. It's only one level of government. The provincial government gets 42 cents of our dollar, our tax dollar. And they put that into their coffers. The municipal governments get 8 cents of our tax dollar and put that in their coffers. Federal government is at a 50. So each of them have a responsibility back to us, but ultimately it's the federal government. So we have to think about innovative models of urban indigenous self-government with that continuum of care around the appropriate services that our people need. So as I think I heard earlier from our CEO, Jim DeVoe, CMHC is engaging numerous stakeholders, I think they're called, on uh, discussions around how can we best turn these dollars over to the indigenous community so we can enhance services. And it's our, it's our us here, we have to be thinking about what does that look like so that we're able to support our urban, rural, remote brothers and sisters wherever they may be in this country called Canada. 85% of the indigenous population now live off the terrace. 85%, 50% of those folks are under the age of 25. Profound differences when you compare our population to that of the non-indigenous population. When you compare the fertility rate of the indigenous population, which is around 3.46 or something to that effect, to the non-indigenous population, which is 1.5. They can't even replace their population right now because they're aging. We have a very different set of priorities than the mainstream population. And then we have very different battles because of how colonialism is playing out in 2003. And I, I have to say this to you because it's real, folks. These aren't just numbers. It's real. I know a young man, I don't like to give you know, reduction of stories, but we all know this. I know one young man, there's 15 people living in one unit, at a three bedroom unit. Four generations. And we all know those stories. We all know people that are subject to the worst living conditions you could possibly imagine because of the lack of funding, the lack of coordination between all levels of government as it relates to our unique needs uh, as officer of indigenous people. There was a report that came out a couple of years ago in the downtown east side. 
over 250 youth was estimated to be in the downtown east side, in those single room occupancy units, SROs. And if you ever go into them, it, it, it is hell on earth. There are gangs in there, there are, they're infested, they are the worst condition. And the reason our young people go to that area is that they need a safe place. They got nowhere else to go. And then they get caught up because the gangs are there and they're easy prey. They're very easy prey because all the kids want a bit of money in their jeans. They want a nice pair of running shoes, a nice hat or whatever. So this cycle continues. We know this happens. We know that in a lot of these single room occupancy units that the gangs take over the units of the women. They turn them into prostitutes. In their own units, we know the housing providers do not have the appropriate resources to administer safe, suitable, or affordable housing. All the housing providers know that. All the government levels know that. But somehow, it's getting worse. The pandemic, here, the now that that's my offices, everybody shut their doors down. Service providers shut all the doors down. The people were literally fucking over each other during the pandemic. It was absolutely disheartening to see that civil society could let this happen. These are people's children, brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles. They're human beings. They're citizens. They deserve dignity. We know that uh, CMHC Canada has been working for decades to not recognize their responsibility for the officer and people. So we've had that battle uh, in Fern. I love hanging out with Fern because I'm young relative to him. But those were the battles he was fighting 50 years ago. And finally, we got the Daniels decision, decision under our belt. And somehow, the colonizers twisted that against us. It's our work. It's our collective work. And this is just one area where we have to turn the tables on that. We have to build unity amongst ourselves, our political organizations, our service delivery organizations, our peoples who are fighting to survive. And again, Section 9124 of the Canadian Constitution, that was the Daniel Supreme Court decision which recognizes the federal government that has that responsibility, not the provinces. Provinces today are collecting untold millions of dollars on our behalf from the federal government, plus what they're taxing us. Think about that. And it's the same thing with the civic governments. They get eight cents of our tax dollar. And we're beggars in our own lands. We're beggars. And it's shameful. The officer voices have been silenced. And it's only recently that we're starting to see the emergence. I consider us a sleeping giant of peoples. When we start to wake up, when we start talking to each other, we start seeing what our common goals are. And then your job today is how are we going to do that? Because we know the what. We all know the what. Now we're going to talk about the how. How we're going to do it. CAP has been at the forefront, taking Canada to court on its version of UNDRIP. We're still waiting for the United Nations whether or not they're going to take our case. But CAP has been there advocating at the international and federal level and working with the provincial organizations and we're working with local communities. That old Indian Act. It's the Indian Act. Nobody, I don't know any indigenous person anywhere that likes the Indian Act. Is there anyone in here that likes the Indian Act? Someone put their hand up if you like the Indian Act. Oh, just Ambrose. 
We gotta think about that Indian act. We gotta remember that these things are real. They happen to us every single day. That act is the most archaic legislation in any Western liberal democracy of the world today. Today. It's the re it's the tool. It's used against us. We're not allowed to talk about that. We gotta be polite. We can't talk about the pain and suffering that's done to our women. We've had to flee the reserves, the children that never got the right to live in their communities. We don't get to talk about the pain and suffering it continues to put on our people. So the current, the current station-based indigenous housing strategies do not and cannot meet the needs of our communities. Distinctions-based approach. Wherever I go to speak, I always raise distinctions-based approach. And I always ask everybody in the room, have you ever heard of distinctions-based approach? And no one has ever put their hand up. Well, we have, because this is what we do, but I'm saying in the communities I've gone to where people are just struggling to get food on their table or a safe house to live, they've never heard of distinction-based approach. So this is a new instrument that, uh, of course, CAP is challenging. Uh, BC was claiming to be the first to pass it in Canada and then the state of Vancouver. And if any of you, uh, those of you that uh, walked out with me uh, yesterday and will be one with again, this is seven years of this federal government. We were told sunny ways. We were told uh, under it. We were told TRC 94 calls. 231 calls to the Smart Indigenous Women's Report. But today, 45% of the homeless population are Indigenous peoples. 62% of the children in care in British Columbia are Indigenous. Well over 50% of the missing murdered women in BC and across Canada are Indigenous. The population, the prison population, only a couple of years ago it was 30%. Today it's 32%. Is this what we need by reconciliation? The homeless strategy, the housing strategy in Canada that has in place is incarceration, is foster care, is shelters, is living. So much money is being spent over that. $200,000 to keep one of our people in prison. Man, could we buy some houses with that? Right? So we need to be mindful of that. Most of you folks, only a couple months ago, the downtown east side was flooded on both sides of the streets with tents. Over 50 of those, 50 percent of the people in those tents are indigenous. They're your people because they come from all over Canada. And then our children are in those campsites. Our women are being victimized. Drug gangs are going in there and using them. Life is absolutely out. And so what is our new mayor do? He comes in with the police and starts wrapping up all their stuff and kicking them out. Now they're being dispersed all over the city again. Same thing they're doing in Victoria, and I suspect elsewhere. Oh my goodness, I gotta say this too because I was just in Edmonton. And I, I told this story about my cousin who was in Toronto very recently, drug addict, out in the streets. He got brought to the hospital, he had third degree um, frostbite, they're gonna have to cut all his legs off. Right. These are this is real in my family. I've been talking to my colleague back from Alberta. She's going, the number of amputees in Edmonton alone has doubled compared to last year. Double. What is the cost of the healthcare system for all that money going over there that should be put into housing and the support to be to get in front of these issues? So there is great risk that the proposed federal strategy will fall short of a robust strategy capable of providing mechanisms for meaningful online engagement. We have a very big responsibility here today. And that's what we've been doing and that's what we will be doing, is how do we create a strategy that's going to honor our people, honor our <laughs> constitutional rights, to ensure that we not only have a plan, but it's implemented and it's evaluated, and that it's appropriately funded.
because $300 is not going to cut it. Our, the homeless population is increasing. The prison population is increasing. The child apprehension industry is increasing. A lot of money spent on the colonial industry. So the six objectives that need to be part of the first phase is prevent further growth in Indigenous housing needs off reserve. Reduce the core needs among off reserve status and non status Indians and Métis. Preserve and improve the existing urban Indigenous housing stock. Reduce the risk of homelessness. Increase the non reserve home ownership rates. Build Indigenous resources and capacity for Indigenous representative organizations. We are the political organizations. It is our job to be the mouth of our, of our folks. We have a very different agenda than service organizations. We're political beings, and that's what we exist for. And uh, funding for the off-reserve uh, uh, organizations to do that work has not gone up in I don't know how, how long, it could be decades for all I know, but it's, it's something that we're working on. Housing must be understood as an integral component of self-government and self-determination. I don't know any indigenous person in my life that ever ceded their right to self-determination. Not one. Is there anyone here besides you, Ambrose? Did you ever cede your right to self-determination? <laughs> None of us. Not one of us. So under the urban, rural, and northern indigenous housing strategy, authority and funding. Those are always the two most important things. Authority and funding. Who controls it? To design, deliver, and administer housing and housing services must be part of a self-government process with the federal government. But what does that mean? Lots of great work went into the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, 1996. 440 plus recommendations. I suggest you look at it. Within those recommendations are models of urban self-determination. You don't even have to invent the wheel. It's already there. You just gotta read it. Imagine a world where the federal and the provincial and the civic governments are pulling the resources in an authority in a given area where the service providers are there, the chiefs are there, the Métis are there, the Inuit are there, and taking academia and making evidence-based decisions on how you allocate those resources. <coughs> Imagine that world. Our did. So a sub-accord between Canada and CAP concerning housing and housing services needs to be negotiated so affiliates can manage funding in deciding the most effective and appropriate action. Okay, I think this is the last one. Yes. So, <coughs> the Congress of Aboriginal People, formerly the Native Council of Canada. 1985, uh, the new uh, constitution was repatriated by then uh, uh, Trudeau, uh, Pierre Trudeau, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Section 35, Section 25, our rights to self-determination, the inherent rights policy to self-government. They failed to fill in what they called the empty box of Section 35. So what they did after the failed uh, four cables that they had between 1985 and 1987, Trudeau was gone, uh, Mulroney was it, four failed cables to fill in Section 35. So what did Canada do? They went to political accords. CAP has a political accord with Canada. CAP has identified six items to negotiate with Canada. Housing is one of them. So with our work through, through the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, the political accord, we've never stopped advocating for what Section 35 looks like as it relates to our rights to self-determination. So with that, I want to, uh, I just want to put my hands up to you all. Thank you for uh, taking time to my retired show.